I've got no idea why this contact form was so damn hard. Alright, sit down. I'm about to tell you what you need to hear. Take a step back and really consider, am I doing this with the right tools? In software development, whether it's the programming language you use, the design paradigm of your code base, or the dependencies you bring in, these are all different tools in your toolbox you need to consider. I'm not telling you to go rewrite all your code in Rust. I might enjoy it myself, but there are things at a smaller scale that you should be paying more attention to as well. Hi, I'm Destiny, a software engineer of 6 plus years, and in today's video I want to talk about a recent experience of mine, and I hope I can help you avoid falling down the pitfall of using the wrong tool for the job. We're back on my personal website today, and the situation I want to bring up is a contact form I added to my website. This is a site I've been working on and using as a living example throughout my past few videos, and I encourage you to watch those videos for more context. But here's what you need to know. This is a site I have built using Rust, and I've developed it with the mindset of using a minimal amount of dependencies. I want the site to be bulletproof and run on a toaster, while being the easiest thing in the world to maintain. This living example isn't meant to be copied, but to be an example to guide your own judgments. What I have built is something I hope to continue to expand on in the future, and share my story along the way to help other developers build great things. Back to the contact form, here's the main code that creates the actual element on the page. Code won't kill ya, I'll walk you through it. This function will generate the HTML that represents my form. This uses a great library called mod to handle the templating of HTML. There are a few inputs to take the name and the message a user wants to send. Optionally, it can show form errors. The reason this is optional is to avoid sending errors on a fresh form as technically it fails to check when it's empty, and that isn't what I want to show when I'm displaying a fresh form. Additionally, while it works without JavaScript, I've gone ahead and used another library called HTMX that I talked about in my last video, Web Frameworks, and why you don't need one. HTMX allows you to do powerful things based on the idea of continuing the underdeveloped hypertext specification, and feels like it should just be part of the HTML specification. This is an optional addition, but one I feel is very welcome here, as it allows me to greatly improve the user experience and build richer experiences without leaving my backend. Here, mainly I've just added some HTML attributes prefixed with HX. These are all HTMX properties, specifying where and how to send requests, along with where and what to do with the response. All of this results in a basic form. It ain't much, but it's honest work. It can show error messages and even has a spinner indicating to the user that it's waiting on a server response, which is a sweet bonus of HTMX. It's a very nice touch, especially with a bit of fading animation. This isn't where the main work of all of this comes from, though. For that, we need to go to the component function. The component function is where this gets interesting. It uses the main component function from earlier, which generates the HTML. If the state of the form is just the plain empty form, it'll send back the form with no errors shown, as it's empty. If instead it was submitted with form data, it'll check if the form has any errors, and if so, immediately just return the main component with errors. After that point, if submitting the form at submit form DB fails, it can also send back the form with error messages as well. In the case it does succeed, it'll return a different response containing a thank you message. A neat trick you can do with HTMX is making a component trigger itself after a duration on load. Effectively, this allows you to make a component that can replace itself. That's used to reload the form component 10 seconds after it is loaded, replacing it with the original, cleared version. In the case where JavaScript isn't enabled, the user will need to refresh the page or click the button to get a new form, which seems reasonable. This main part of developing all the front-end pieces was actually pretty quick to get put together in the first place, and I found it fun to approach designing a piece of my website in this way. I think I'll continue using it going forward. But this is the point where the project ground to a halt. The function submitFormDB originally used a crate called Postgres and is finally the point I wanted to talk about now that I've provided you with the background of my situation. When you begin to work with a database, there are a lot of considerations you need to take into account, including maintenance, security, resource utilization, and the cost, ease, and speed of development. It took me days to figure out what database I wanted to use going forward, learning how to deal with migrating data, and finding ways to work with it. Even after I got the data into the database, how would I view it? And more importantly, how can I securely access it away from home? That's the neat part. I actually approached this problem the entire wrong way, and that question ultimately led me to realizing it. Why was I storing these in a database in the first place? My original solution I came up with in my head was grand. Admin dashboards, authentication, rate limiting, amazing tools for projects, but a pain to maintain and do right. I just wanted to be able to view the data sent to this form in a convenient way and be able to tell which ones I haven't seen, delete ones I don't care about, and be able to tell when they were sent, and that the user knows that it made it. Wait a minute, that sounds a lot like email or messaging. Sending an email is annoying at best, but maybe that messaging idea has some merit. For some stray encounters with it, I knew Discord had a neat feature called webhooks. Webhooks, if you don't already know about them, are a neat thing a lot of websites or services support and it's basically just a server sending an HTTP request to another server on an event. In the case of Discord, if you send it a webhook, it will put a message into the chat channel the webhook is for. These can be customized, and I ended up with something that looks like this. 
The name used in the contact form is used as the chat username. The content of the form is the content of the message. And at the bottom of the message, I've added an embed stating the source of the webhook so I could tell it apart from other messages I could add in the future. To start with, we have the data we want to include with the webhook. This is done with a library called JSON. Additionally, I have minrec here to handle sending the actual webhook, which is just an HTTP post request with some data. When Discord receives this webhook, it posts that info as a chat message. Originally, when I was looking at using a crate called Postgres, and of course adding a Postgres database to my list of services I run, that same function looked like this. What this does is first ensure a table exists that is used for the form data, and then insert the form data that was received into that same table. This isn't perfect, and that table check should only be done on startup or migration, but it's fine for this example. The database implementation up to this point was pretty simple. As you can see with the code, it's not too difficult to understand, so long as you're able to read the madness that is SQL. But leading up to that development work, I had to spend days planning out my database strategy. Where and how would I deploy this separate database service? Where would the data be stored? How would I view this data? What's the plan for migrations in the future to support new schemas? I felt like I was spinning my wheels on a problem that should be really simple. I just want to be able to view some damn form responses. Pulling back towards webhooks, their simplicity and ease of use is extremely valuable here. I can easily update how these are handled and it isn't a complex process, just a few lines of code total. Not even to begin mentioning, a large amount of transitive packages were dropped and my solution was now solved instead of being uselessly partially complete. It focused too much on the perfection of something I have not built up to yet and will take a lot of time still to get to. During the process of developing this feature, I kept my idea of limited dependencies in mind. I've added a total of four dependencies this time around for a few purposes. Form URL encoded data, which I used to parse the form data submitted by the browser. .env for handling secrets in my development environment via a .env file. JSON, a JSON library which I use for formatting data for webhooks. And minrec, which is used to send HTTP POST requests to handle webhooks. Touching back on form URL encoded, it allowed me to parse all form data out in a way which allowed me to validate it as I pulled the data into my backend. This was instrumental in making the system for form validation simple and easy to add to while playing into Rust's very beautiful iterators. All of the tools mentioned I feel like have added a great amount of value to my project with six transitive dependencies. I would call this a massive win as the amount of new things I can do has been greatly expanded for very little cost and little dependency on third parties. Of course, I did add a dependency on a third party service now to handle my forms, but I think in practice this is perfectly fine. This is something within a few minutes I can transition to pointing at another service, and it will indicate to the user the form hasn't actually been submitted if the webhook is failing. Honestly though, I don't see this as a major problem in the near future, and there are also other ways to contact me, so if it breaks for a few hours a year, I'll still sleep fine. While I do still have grand visions for my site, and there are many features I'd like to add to it, in this case the solution I need is simple. I overthought the problem entirely and got caught in a spider web of dependencies, projects, and work. I did learn from it, but these are the kind of traps that end up ending my projects if I'm not careful. Let's keep development simple and use the right tool for the job. Thank you for watching. This video was in the works for longer than I wanted, but I think it ended up being an important lesson for myself. I've ended up working with some new ideas and tooling I haven't before, but ended up with what I actually wanted at the end of the day. What are your thoughts on how I approach developing this feature? Let me know down below. I ask that if you did enjoy the video, please make sure to leave a like, and if you want to see more of these kind of videos, go ahead and hit the subscribe button, as there's more to come. Plus, you can say you were part of the first 1,000 subscribers, which there's less than 200 spots left. Anyways, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Go make something cool!